Hello, and welcome back to Data-Driven Methods in Dynamical Systems. Today, I want to talk to you about dowsing. This is a sort of divination that used to be used, or, well, it actually still is used, to find water and other things through the ground using a pair of sticks. Now, if you're a millennial like me, then Dowsing probably brings up the uh, thought of video games and Breath of the Wild, where you use dowsing to find shrines and, and other objects that help you increase your health and stamina. But dowsing is something that has been used throughout Europe and the United States for a very long time. Generally, dowsing has been discredited because, I mean, you're using two sticks to try to see through the ground and you're trying to detect water. Well, I mean, if you're trying to look for a source of water, then the water in your body is going to be a lot closer to those two sticks than, say, water that might be six or seven feet underground. At the same time, water diviners can often find water, and that's because water's sort of all over the place. If you just sort of dig deep enough, you'll find it. Whereas people who use the dousing method will tell you that this is the particular spot that you need to dig to find water. And yeah, well, they're going to be right, as long as you dig far enough. Dowsing has appeared in media uh, even recently, where we have the movie The Water Diviner, and that was a 2014 movie with Russell Crowe. It was my job to steer my boys to manhood. I failed them. So you can find water, but you can't even find your own children. And there we actually see him using two sticks to find a new spot for as well. Now, I believe the dowsing and the water finding itself ends up being a metaphor for the actual subject of the movie, which is to find two lost people during World War II. Now, even though it is a really old method and you might think a few esoteric people use dowsing to find water sources, but physics student Sally Lee Page wrote in her Medium article that she discovered that the UK water companies actually use dowsing to find new sources of water. This seems rather absurd that a water company itself would use dowsing, but they doubled down and they admitted on their Twitter feed, maybe even proudly, that they used divination in order to figure out what roads to shut down and to find a, a new source of water. This is, of course, insane and, and absurd, especially with all sorts of new techniques, and in England is an island, you can find water pretty much anywhere. But, you know, it's the modern world, and strangely, some parts are more modern than the others. So today what I want to talk to you about is a sort of modern day version of dowsing. And this it uses kernel methods and nonlinear estimators to extract information from a few samples of say the water table or aquifers and extract it to the, the broader region underground. And this method of dowsing is called Krigging and it is used in hydrology and other fields of geology and geostatistics and it is very closely connected to reproducive kernel helper spaces and kernel methods. Which brings us a lot closer to what we would want to talk about in this class, which are, which is ultimately going to be about kernel methods applied to dynamical systems. So this takes us one step closer to the ultimate goal in our class. So why don't we go ahead and talk about Krigging. So the theory behind Krigging is it's not too bad, but we do have to go into a little bit of probability and statistics. I'm not a statistician, so a lot of this stuff I always have to kind of look up again as I go. So what we're going to be dealing with is what is called a random function. So what a random function is here is that when you take a sample from a site, you're really taking a sample from some sort of probability distribution at that site. So when we write, say, the expectation of z of x, for a random function z, what we mean really is that for the fixed point x, we're looking at the expectation for the probability distribution that corresponds to that site itself. And what our goal is, is that we want to construct a model for the entire site. More than just samples at a few places, we would like to extend this to uh, be a lot more general and tell us things about, say, water levels or core samples or other things distributed throughout the, the rest of the region. Now, two lemmas are going to be really important for us here is one, the expectation of the square of a linear combination of samples of these random functions. And what that's going to end up giving us is a matrix where we have the sum 
of lambda i times lambda j of the expectation of z of x i times z of x j, where the lambda i corresponds to the coefficients that correspond to a linear combination. Now, why do we care about these linear combinations? What we're going to do is we're going to try to find the right coefficients that will allow us to extrapolate from these sampled sites themselves. So the whole goal of this method is to try to find all these lambda i's. Now this will end up taking us through a route through what is called a covariance matrix, which we can then go ahead and insert some of our kernel methods where we can look at a feature space corresponding to our data that can then be turned into a covariance matrix. And another result that we care about is the variance of a linear combination of our samples of our random functions. And this ends up giving us the covariance matrix. So this is a sum from i and j going from one up to k of lambda i times lambda j times the covariance of zx i and zx j. So there are three assumptions to Kriging and well, simple Kriging in particular. The first two actually apply to Kriging as a whole, but the third one is what makes it simple Kriging. The first one is that sampling is a partial realization of a random function at the site x. So the random function here is assumed to be second order stationary, which means that moments involving up to two variables are insensitive to joint spatial translation. And that can be represented through equations here, straight out of the book. And a third one is what really distinguishes this as simple Kriging. And that is assuming that the mean of each of our sample points is known. And now Kriging in general assumes that the mean is constant throughout the region, but usually we don't know what that mean is. And so simple Kriging adds the assumption that we have a mean of known, some known quantity, say m. Now the reason for this is it makes the mathematics a lot easier, uh, and we don't have to actually employ anything like Lagrange multipliers and other things like that. We can just do sort of a straight inversion of a covariance matrix. Now later in another video I might go back through and um, maybe append a video to the end of this, uh, where we go into what is called general Kriging, which is a little bit more sophisticated than simple Kriging. And this, we do have to use things like Lagrange multipliers and other optimization tools in order to, uh, to resolve this coefficient issue. So ultimately what we're looking for is a second order stationary random function, Z hat, which is a linear combination of our sample points. And since we wanted to represent the field as a whole, we also want this to have the known average uh, or the known mean m. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set z hat to say some arbitrary site x naught is equal to m plus the sum of lambda i times z of x i minus m. And having z, I, a, z x i minus m uh, ensures that when we take the expectation of this quantity we're ultimately going to get the expectation is being m. And so that will mean that our estimator is going to actually satisfy the third assumption of having the known mean m. Now the rest of this uh, is really about finding out what those lambda i's are. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for the, uh, the estimation variance sigma squared. And the idea is that we want to select these lambda i's so that it minimizes this quantity. In order to get to this covariance, we have to use the second order stationary property and, and the idea of a residual, which is another random function that is given by z of x minus the expectation of z of x. Now, because we're subtracting by the expectation, when you take the expectation of this residual quantity, y, what you're gonna get is an expectation of zero. Now we can leverage that and the fact that we have a second order stationary random function to show that the covariance uh, between xi and xj is equal to the covariance with respect to y of xi and xj. And this also uses the fact that we have a known mean. So then for a for the random function estimator that we made, a z hat at x naught, the variance squared at x naught can be written in terms of these covariance functions. In particular, it can be written as the covariance of x naught comma x naught minus a linear combination of the covariance of x i comma x naught, and this is all multiplied by lambda i's, plus uh, this double sum going from i and j going from one up to k of lambda i 
times lambda j times the covariance between lambda i and lambda j. And so the idea is that we want to minimize this quantity. And in order to minimize this quantity, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take a derivative with respect to lambda i, or rather with respect to lambda. And when I say derivative, what I'm really saying is that we're going to take a gradient, or if you'd rather we just take a partial derivatives one at a time with respect to these functions, ultimately it gives you the same thing, because what we're going to do next is we're going to set that equal to zero. When we set that equal to zero, we end up with a matrix equation where we want to invert this covariance matrix against this vector of the covariance at x i comma x naught. And then that will actually give us our lambdas. <laughs> Once we have these lambdas, then we can go ahead and construct z hat at x naught by adding back that m and multiplying by uh, the quantities uh, z of x i minus m. And once we do that, ta-da, we have done simple Kriging. This actually isn't all that bad and it's really, really close to interpolation of using kernel functions. And so what we can do is we can replace the covariance by other kinds of covariance. So we have things that come from feature spaces and the covariance there being represented through uh, kernel functions that are positive definite. And even in this book, he mentions that the covariance matrix has to be positive definite for all this to work because we have to be able to invert the covariance matrix. Now, there are a lot of kernel functions that we can use. We can use... Okay, so when I was editing that video, I realized that I mentioned kernel functions, but I don't think I really went into exactly what's going on there. So, in general, if you take a look at the paper or the, the chapter that I'm following, he mentions the covariance matrix, and this comes from uh, probability distribution, expectations, etc. And so you have to have some sort of probability distribution in order to figure out what your covariance is of two different data points, sample points, say x and xi and xj. But at the end of the day, you usually don't know what the probability distribution is. You need to choose something for this, and this comes from uh, Gaussian processes, where you use something like a Gaussian kernel function or other kinds of kernel functions to represent your, your covariance matrix. And so essentially what you do is you, you send a data point, say x out of say r squared or r cubed or r to 20th, some finite dimensional point. And you send it to an infinite dimensional feature space or at least a very, very large dimensional feature space. What this means is that you basically send it to a sequence of functions. And so the sequence of functions could be as simple as sending, say, x to 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and all the way down, an infinite sequence of, you know, of every power of x. And this would correspond to, say, the Hardy space's Zago kernel. Now, what you do after you send your points to this space of features is that you want to figure out some way of comparing them and this uh, comes through an inner product just like in r n you have the dot product which compares basically how much in the same direction a data point is to another data point the same sort of dot product idea measures sort of the similarity and direction of the feature spaced mapping of your data points and how do you enact this dot product? Well, it becomes an infinite series of these features evaluated at x and say another data point y. But of course, this is gonna be impossible to really evaluate directly. And so you'd need to come up with some other way of doing it. And that's what these kernel functions are. So these kernel functions enact an inner product on the space. And a lot of times we actually can write an explicit formula for these kernel functions, things like the Gaussian radial basis function or the exponential dot product kernel or polynomial kernels or other things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use these as our inner product, our similarity measures, and these become the measure of covariance between two data points. And so then we can make a covariance matrix of this kernel function and this is called the gram matrix where basically you take every pairwise collection of points and you make a matrix out of them and then once you do that you have this whole covariance setup and the rest of the algorithm really will follow uh, what you see in in this book on geostatistics so all right so with that i'm gonna drop back and we'll return to our discussion now mind you i don't do krigging and this isn't my field of expertise what i do is work with reproducing kernel hilbert spaces and 
coming up with new kernel functions for different sort of applications. But I don't think anything I said is manifestly wrong, but if, I, if I'm off on anything and you know more than I do, please do comment on this YouTube video or if you're in my class, send me an email. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna boot up MATLAB and we'll do some uh, simulated examples and see how we can actually implement this as an algorithm. Let's go ahead and take a look at the MATLAB code. So this is a straight implementation of uh, simple Kriging. Now, this is using the idea that we know the mean, which maybe we do, maybe we don't, and that could affect the performance here. So this ends up being a little bit different than straight kernel interpolation. In fact, we use the covariance vector in order to get at some weights that we then apply to the, uh, to the samples in order to get our estimation. So usually what you do in a kernel interpolation is you find the weights by inverting the gram matrix, then that gives you a fixed collection of weights that you can later use for your interpolation, and this ends up working relatively quickly. However, for this application, we're gonna have to evaluate new weights for every single point that we choose. And so these lambda i's are gonna kind of be fluctuating with the different choices of sight. So all the discussion that we did before using a covariance matrix was determining the weights given that we have pre-selected some site for our sample. And we were trying to get an estimation for what using the other sites that we've already sampled in order to, or guessing the value of say the depth of water or the amount of ore that we'll find out of, it, out of a particular place. So what I'm doing is I'm applying a Kriging method uh, against a, a simulated example, and this is Frankie's function, which is one of the standard bearers in function approximation. We're not going to see a perfect recreation of this function using this simple Kriging. We will see a bit of qualitative information that we can extract, and, and we have the original function to compare against to see exactly how good we're doing. What we need to do is we need to uh, define a kernel function, and here we're using Gaussian, and this is going to give us our covariance. And then we make a Gram matrix using that kernel function, and then we make up the, the sort of covariance vector that we're going to be using to determine these weights. And then after that, it's simply multiplying that collection of weights by the samples we've already found, minus the mean that we supposedly know, and then we add the mean after that, and then that gives us our estimation. And so then I go ahead and I'll go ahead and plot it. It takes a little bit of time to plot, uh, just because we have to do this matrix inversion over and over again, and that's not really a very quick thing to do. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and uh, and jump into this. Okay, so here we go. Now we have, I'm doing a tick and a talk, oh, if I remember to do a talk, and so that'll tell us exactly how long the code has to run, so we can see a change as we change the number of samples that we're doing. So to start off, what we're doing is we are taking a look at Frankie's function, which is a sort of linear combination of a bunch of Gaussians. If I come down to this section, since I already ran the code, I can just go ahead and play this so you can see exactly uh, what we're dealing with. So if I evaluate this, this is Frankie's function. And so it has a couple of mounds, uh, one bigger than the other, and then it has one dip. And so we're looking for that same sort of feature out of our simple Kriging method. And so in order to do this, we need to define a kernel, and this kernel function defines our covariance measure. And so, <clears throat> and so basically what we're having here is that this is the Gaussian, uh, and so it takes two points in the plane, and uh, takes the square of the, of, their, of the norm of their difference, and, uh, and then it puts it into uh, an exponential function. And with a minus sign and divided by mu. Mu determines the exact width of the region, and so I'm choosing, uh, or the, mu determines the width of the influence of a particular kernel function, and I'm choosing mu to be one half. Our region of that we're considering is going to be a zero to one, and so one half basically means that the influence of this kernel is going to reach to roughly the boundaries no matter where we choose. And so, um, so then I'm choosing 30 samples, and this is coming from the Halton sequence. This is another very generic uh, plotting thing. And so, for instance, if I take my, if I want to take a look and see what I get here, I can say plot. Uh, we're going to say x uh, samples and say one forward x samples two and everything there and we'll plot with O. Oh, and so this is our Halton sequence for the region. And so they're sort of randomly distributed according to this Halton 
algorithm. And yeah, so it, there's a decent coverage here. We have a good a number of samples of our function. And yeah, so that's a good way to go. All right, and so then we make a grand matrix. And so this is just a double for loop. So we run through all of our samples and then we just, for each one of these locations, we put uh, each sample in each pair of samples uh, into our kernel function and we record this as a matrix. We're assuming that we need a mean. I I don't know what the mean really should be, but I just took the mean of the entire Frankie function. Maybe that, that'll give us something. And so I, I use that. And, uh, and then finally we get to this covariance vector. And so this is more or less our, our kernel function again. I was just trying to be really efficient with it. So I came up with this slick way of coding it. So this will give us uh, a vector of of our covariance of the site that we care about against all the sites we've already sampled. And so for instance, if I do covariance vector and uh, pick a new site, say one half comma one half, uh, this is, sorry, this is what it gives me. So this is just a whole bunch of the kernel functions I uh, evaluated at the new sample and, uh, and all the old samples. And so that's what gives us this vector. So then I need to take the grand matrix and I take its inverse and we're gonna hit that against this covariance vector, which we evaluate each time. And then this is the estimate that we're making. And so we're adding M, which is our mean, and then we're taking our samples and we're subtracting the mean that we know. Again, because we know the mean that is simple Kriging. And so general Kriging, we're gonna to have to come up with another way of getting at this mean. And and yeah, that's, that's a, a task for another day. Although the code itself isn't actually all that bad. So then after that, we just do plots. And so that, I mean, everything I just showed you up here is exactly the simple Kriging method. And you can change the kernel to get different effects. And I don't want to do that here because that means I have to go affect it down here too. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and push play and see what we get. This might take a minute. Nope, oh, that was nice and quick. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so we have these two mounds here, and we see that we still have the two mounds coming up here. This isn't a perfect recreation because, again, this isn't an interpolation method. And so, but we do see a dip where we expect to see it in here. So we have, so if you're trying to figure out, you know, where a good place to, say, do a little bit more mining would be, then you say, well, I've got a good sample over here and you know all the places we've done. It looks like if I go over here, I should find something and I should find something decent over here too. And maybe not as much stuff here. And that's more or less what you'll take from it. And so, so yeah, so that's, that's the Kriging method. And well, at least the simple Kriging method. And yeah, it's not too bad. We can see if I get anything, if I, you know, amp up the, uh, the number of samples. So we'll go from, Let's see how many samples I have. I had 30 here. Let's do 100, see what we get. Okay, now this still gives us mounds and then uh, you know, a region that we're falling down. I noticed though uh, that this all is sitting more or less at the mean. And so, you know, it's sort of getting muddied out by, by this M. So I did a little bit more digging and found the parameter I need to adjust to make this work better. So I showed you before, I, when I had one half and we used 100 samples, we ended up getting something really flat. And this is roughly around what the average is I chose, which was 0.02 or something like that, and or 0 0.2, and, and that's roughly where this sits. But we can, we can improve this by adjusting the uh, parameter for mu. So if I make mu smaller, so all my kernel functions are a lot more concentrated, say I switch it from one half to one tenth, then I get something that looks a lot closer to what we we're looking for. So this is the original function here, and this is the Kriging interpolation for using simple Kriging. All right, now I can still improve this. And what I, what I can do to improve it is I can take it down to say uh, one fiftieth. And so if I go ahead and push play, uh, there we go that's almost identical uh, to the original function here. And so, so yeah, so th that's simple creating actually working out fairly nicely. And yeah, so you need to make sure that you keep your, the concentration of your, your gram matrix uh, 
the concentration of your kernel functions to be a lot closer to the points that they're centered over. And, and then you get this. Uh, what that does is it also improves the conditioning of the gram matrix. So the gram, so the wider the the width of your kernels, the the less invertible your gram matrix is going to be. And so, so there here we see an improvement in gen while we make this. <clears throat> so here we see this improvement, uh, yeah, by reducing the width here. So, okay, so yeah, so that that gives you some sort of confidence that the Kragen method is actually going to give you something meaningful and, and useful and you just have to be very careful about your kernel parameters and and how wide you usually make them usually a good ballpark as far as how wide you should make your kernel functions is as the it, it is roughly around the sort of pairwise minimum distance between your points and so make it like twice that or three times that and you should get generally a decently in invertible gram matrix and we're going to see that come up a lot when we work on other parts of other parts of uh, kernel methods and, and especially when we get into things like dmd and and other aspects of approximation theory okay so i'm going to stop here and i think i think that, that that's good okay uh so thank you for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you made it this far. And if you didn't make it this far, subscribe anyway, but you're not seeing this. So uh, yeah, uh, let's stop and I'll see you next time.